Greetings, folks. Welcome back to our Sky Tonight program. This is Seth Mayo again, curator of astronomy for the Loma Planetarium at MOAS. And as we round out the month of July, we're going to cover the dates of July 25th through July 31st. We're going to start by talking about the Milky Way, since it's a great time of year to see it, and it coincides with a new moon this week. Then we're going to mention the peak of the Southern Delta Aquarid meteor shower that's going on right now. And we're going to end with a look at possibly the oldest and farthest galaxy we've ever seen by the James Webb Space Telescope. So let's dig right into it. From time to time, I like to highlight when there is a new moon. Now, of course, I do love the moon, but when the moon is not out, or really more appropriately, when the far side of the moon is being lit by the sun and the side we normally see is in shadow and we can't see the moon during that time, that can reveal so much in our sky, especially all the dimmer and maybe deep sky objects that are out there. And what I wanna highlight at the moment is one of the most beautiful things in our sky, maybe one of the most beautiful things in nature, and that is our Milky Way. Now, this is great for this week in particular because on the evening of Thursday, July 28th, we have a new moon phase. So we don't have the extra light pollution from the moon. And keep in mind, it's not just on the 28th. A couple of days before and after the new moon date, the skies are very dark. And as we've talked about before, in our summer sky, the brightest part of the Milky Way is visible. And right now, once it's dark in the evening, the Milky Way is well positioned in the sky, high enough above the east and southeastern horizon. And the farther south you are, the higher that central bulge, that really bright region of the Milky Way is visible to us. And what's nice right now is that part of the Milky Way starts off pretty high and you can see it for most of the night and into the early morning right up until dawn. So you have a lot of time to see this beautiful section of the Milky Way. And honestly, one of the best times of the year to see this foggy band in the sky that arcs across the heavens. And unfortunately, many of us, I think it's about 75% of the population, at least of the United States, and a good portion of the world's population cannot see the Milky Way from where they live. Light pollution has invaded our skies and has made it too difficult to see the diffuse clouds of the Milky Way, which is quite unfortunate, because like I was saying, I think it's one of the most beautiful objects in nature. But if you do have a chance to go somewhere darker, that Milky Way is so well positioned, it just is going to dazzle you. And if we did have a really dark location to go to, even here in Stellarium, we can really amp it up here and show you what I mean. So there is that bright central region there, more to the south, at least as seen from Florida. And you may notice Scorpius, the scorpion, as we've talked about before, located right here, the bright red star of Antares right there, and Sagittarius, the teapot-looking constellation there right inside that bright central region. As we've talked about, this is the center of our galaxy where there's a lot of stars, a lot of gas and dust in that part. And this is also the location of Sagittarius A star, right? The black hole at the center that's four million times more massive than our sun that we recently got a picture from the Event Horizon Telescope, this radio telescope's from around the world. So that makes this area even more special and interesting and of course cultures over time throughout history had their ideas of what this was some cultures like the cherokee native americans thought it was cornmeal that a dog had stolen that he dropped across the sky cultures far away from each other like the egyptians and the aboriginal australians sometimes believe this was a river of water through the sky and the egyptians as well associating with a goddess cow named Bat that spilled this milk across the sky. And that's most famously what the ancient Greeks thought of when they saw this diffuse band of light. And originally the ancient Greek name for this is where we get a very important word that relates to what this is. Because in ancient Greek, this was called Galaxius Kiklos. Galaxius comes from the word gala, which means milk, and Kiklos means circle. So basically it meant milky circle and that word galaxius eventually transformed into the word galaxy that we use today and now we know that this band of light 
is the disk of our own Milky Way galaxy. We live in a spiral galaxy that's mostly like a flat disk with most of the stars embedded in that disk. And from Earth's perspective, as we see it in the sky, we're looking through the plane or disk of that galaxy that we are a part of. And if you're in a dark enough location, you can really see all of the kind of clouds of gas and dust. Some of that dust is blocking light from behind it. Some of that gas and dust is actually glowing and is showing so much interesting detail and shapes. You can even create your own pictures within the Milky Way, not stars, but pictures of the gas clouds. Some folks, especially in the central region, see kind of a horse right here. It's a little tough maybe here in Solarium to see it, but some people see like the head of a horse and some legs. Uh, in this part, these kind of dark dust lanes we find here. It's just gorgeous. And like I said, this is a great time of year to view this. Now, of course, this depends on your weather. Here in the Southeast United States, this is our wet season. So there's a lot more chances of thunderstorms and humidity at this time of year. But sometimes things clear up. If you're in a drier area for the summertime, this is a wonderful time to see something like this. So hopefully you have a chance to see the Milky Way. It is well positioned in the sky, especially with the new moon this week, darkening the skies even more. And you can see the place we live in, our Milky Way, in all of its vibrance and its beauty. Now, as we take advantage of this new moon around the 28th, if we just move ahead a day or two on the evening of the 29th or the morning of the 30th, that is Saturday morning, July 30th, we have the peak of the annual Southern Delta Aquarid Meteor Shower. It's a lesser known meteor shower and really actually favors more of the southern latitudes of Earth or especially if you're in the southern hemisphere. If you're in the northern hemisphere like we are, this is not as celebrated and talked about, but there's still a chance to see the meteors coming from an area inside the constellation of Aquarius the Water Bear. Now this is really early in the morning on Saturday, July 30th, when Aquarius is a little higher in the sky. And I know this is kind of a hard constellation to find. Aquarius is not very bright. It's one of the dimmer constellations out there. But right now, it's actually not too difficult because the planets of Saturn, which is right here, and Jupiter are on either side. Saturn's a little bit closer to it, and that's the dimmer of the two planets right now. And then Jupiter, you'll see a little bit later, kind of rising out of the east, but to the left of Aquarius in this view. So right around the leg portion of Aquarius, right about here, near one of the brighter stars of Aquarius named Scat right there. So in this region there is the radiant point for the Southern Delta Aquarid meteor shower. And when we say radiant point again, we're not saying it's where you're gonna see all of the meteors, it's just where they originate from. So if you do find a meteor in the sky and you trace it back and it's from this meteor shower, you should trace it back to about this point right here. And like I said, this favors more of the Southern Hemisphere or if you're in Southern latitudes, but there's a chance to see it from all over the world. You can see up to about 20 meteors per hour if it's dark. And again, there is a new moon, at least on the night or two before. And even by then, even though it's technically not a new moon by this time frame, the moon is still very, very small in its phase. So it will not add any extra light pollution. The source of this meteor shower has been quite confusing and a little tough to pin down over the years. Right now, we think it's from a comet called 96P McColtz. But over the years, we thought other comets contributed to this, or it maybe is a conglomeration, a combination of objects and their debris trails that we're flying through at this time of the year that produces this meteor shower. So maybe you'll have a chance to see this. This doesn't just run now. It runs actually from July 18th through August 21st, but we're finding typically the peak of it happens near the end of July, as we find here. Now, while we're still in this area of the sky, looking at Aquarius, if you're up real early in the morning before sunrise, there is an area of the sky we're gonna find a pretty obscure and very, very difficult constellation to find, unless you have a star map or a stargazing app to find it. And that is a constellation called Sculptor. And we'll kind of pinpoint it in this location here. Let's turn off Aquarius here just to give us the view that we want to see of Sculptor here and hopefully I'm going to click on the right star because again very obscure very tough constellation this is Sculptor the sculpture constellation it basically forms a triangle a very dim 
triangle in the sky. And if you're in more southern latitude locations, it's visible enough for you to see above maybe the southeastern horizon very early in the morning right now. You might be wondering, why am I mentioning this obscure and tough to see constellation? Well, this is actually the location of a galaxy that was recently studied and observed by the James Webb Space Telescope. Of course, the telescope we've been talking about quite a bit lately because of those first images that came out recently that are gorgeous, maybe you had a chance to see them. And it's so exciting to see the potential of this new space-based observatory that sits almost a million miles from the Earth that sees an infrared light. Well, just recently there's been a study, a paper that was released from a couple teams that may have found the oldest and the farthest galaxy we've ever seen. That is still yet to be confirmed, so this is just a maybe, but it's very exciting that so early in the use of James Webb that this type of galaxy has been found. That's really cool. And it has a couple names. It's a very technical name based off where the study came from. The two names you're gonna hear is Glass Z13 or GHZ2. So these are two studies from two different teams that looked at this galaxy located right about here in Sculptor, the Sculpture constellation, right in that location. And what they found is this red blob you see here. And at first glance, I know it just looks like a weird red blob, but this is very exciting because this may be the oldest galaxy we've ever seen at about 300 million years after the Big Bang. So for those who don't know, the Big Bang is the beginning of our universe, that initial expansion of the universe from a singularity of all the matter in the universe coming from this single tiny point, expanded from there 13.8 billion years ago. And then from there, the universe formed eventually when atoms started forming as the universe cooled down and then eventually the first stars and galaxies formed. So we're trying to determine what that early universe looks like. And this galaxy may come from that early universe, only have formed about 300 million years after the Big Bang. This would be one of the earliest galaxies we have ever seen. Just to compare this to the Hubble Space Telescope, which has the current record of seeing the oldest galaxy ever at about 400 million years after the Big Bang, this may beat it by 100 million years. And just so you know, as we look at things so far back, you're actually looking really far away. So this galaxy is about 13.4, maybe 13.5 billion light years away. The light has taken that many years to travel from this red blob to reach us and eventually the James Webb Space Telescope. And this new space telescope is suited to look at stuff like this because the light from the stars and this galaxy that's very young would have been emitted in optical wavelengths, invisible light. And over time, the universe has been expanding. We've known that for some time. And that stretches the light. It's called the Doppler effect. And that red shifting, we call it, is actually moved that light into the spectrum of infrared, which has longer wavelengths of light than the visible portion that our eyes see. And James Webb, the space telescope, can see in the infrared part of the spectrum, a pretty wide swath of it, which allows us to see the youngest stars and galaxies in our universe and the stuff farthest back. So it's, I guess you could say very old light, but you're seeing something very young at the beginning of our universe. And so it's quite amazing. This needs peer review like any good science, so we don't know this for sure. And what's amazing is this is just the beginning. The Space Telescope has the capability of seeing things 100 million years after the Big Bang. So this might just be the appetizer to even more distant and more young objects that tell us the formation of our universe, how it played out, the evolution that we're still trying to unravel, which can help us better understand ourselves, our own stars, our sun, our own galaxy, and how that formed after something like this had formed so many billions of years ago. So it's exciting to see this new space telescope do its thing. And it's kind of fun to know where it is in the sky in this obscure constellation of Sculptor. If you're up real early in the morning, and especially in more southern latitudes, you may find the proximal location of glass Z13 or GHZ2, something so very distant, but tells us so much about the universe. Hey, thanks for tuning in to another edition of our Sky Tonight program, and we hope to see you here in person at the Museum of Arts and Sciences at some point if you're in Daytona Beach, and you gotta check out a show in our Loman Planetarium. We're running shows every day. Please check our website 
for more information about our shows and about what we're doing in the museum. And of course, you got to tune into our various social media channels where we're producing so much great content about the museum and of course about the universe and astronomy. So hope to see you back here again. Take care and of course, happy stargazing. <laughs>